direction from Professor Magnus Kogland. So, Professor Magnus Kogland is a professor of catalysis at Chalmers University of Technology, Sweden, since 2004. He is also director for the Complaint Center for Catalysis, KCK, since 2005, and also elected academy member of Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences since 2012. His research concerns designs and studies of new generation of catalyst and catalyst-based concepts for environmental and sustainable energy applications. The research includes mainly kinetic and mechanistic studies of surface processes and connection between catalytic properties like activity, selectivity, and durability, and the physical chemical properties of the catalyst. Today he is going to give a speech on mobility of copper and geolite based SCR catalyst. Thank you, Sharma, for this very nice introduction. <clears throat> and uh, also thank you very much for the organizers to invite me to give uh, the chance to give this uh, keynote speech today. So, I will talk about uh, mobility of copper in Sulite Best Gatalus. So, we continue that story. So, we start with a nice uh, gemstone here. Uh, this is actually a natural zeolite called Chechen Chenite, if I pronounce it correctly. Uh, and here we have another one, not like such as nice, so that, uh, because it's a temp picture, couldn't find any good uh, real picture of that one. But that is uh, Mutinite. And then we have uh, a more familiar one, Shevasite. Uh, these are all natural zeolites. Uh, the Cheshirenite has a, a BE, A structure, which is a large core zeolite with uh, 12, uh, uh, 12 atoms in the ring, or 12, 12 oxygen atoms in the ring. And it has also some uh, synthetic uh, structure analogs, CIT6 and uh, zeolite beta, which is a more important commercial one. Um, the mutanite has the MFI structure, uh, and we more knew about CS1, or even better, ZSM5, uh, which is uh, widely used commercially. And also for the Shabbosite structure, we have uh, some synthetic important one, and SSZ13 and uh, SAP434 are uh, commercially used uh, uh, analogs to the Shabbosite structures. So, uh, this uh, structure uh, can be used as a catalyst, and, uh, as you know, and uh, uh, especially for SCR uh, conditions, uh, there can be alternatives to uh, vanadium-based uh, SCR catalysts, for, especially for mobile applications. Thermal stability and uh, low temperature activity are important issues here to consider. Uh, usually these uh, structures are functionalized with metal cations, uh, most importantly are iron and uh, even better copper. Usually you do that by aqueous ion exchange, so you uh, add an um, uh, aqueous containing uh, solution and then you have an iron exchange. This is usually good, but it requires uh, filtration, washing and drying steps, and especially if you want to have uh, higher uh, metal loadings, uh, you must repeat this several times. For small pore zeolites, uh, as a shabba size structure, it can also sometimes be hindered uh, by the small pores, and also for polar frameworks like in the SAPO 34, it can be quite hard to get in uh, ions via aqueous ion exchange. So, there are alternative methods, and one alternative is uh, solid state ion exchange. Um, that you can do uh, without an aqueous. Uh, that requires however high temperatures, typically 800 degrees Celsius, and that can be um, uh, drastic for the zeolite structure, which might collapse. Uh, some zeolites now, uh, like the Shabbasite, uh, or the SS13, ZZ13, are uh, really stable, but it can cause damage. So, during the years, we have seen signs of that copper might migrate, especially when uh, it's exposed to ammonia CR conditions. There are several studies. I will just mention two. Uh, here we have a study made by uh, Peter Wennerstrom and Talitopsi and co-workers, together with Ben uh, Korba in Spain. 
uh, they have studied physical mixtures. So they mix physical uh, ZSM5 uh, powder with copper oxide. And then they expose that to ammonia CO conditions. And that is NO ammonia, oxygen, and water. And they do that for one hour at 550 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> then they analyze uh, this spot here uh, with the EDX. And uh, we can see that we have oxygen, we have silicon, we have aluminum, which should be there. No other, hydrogen we can't see. Uh, we have molybdenum and carbon here also, but that is from the, from the grid here. Uh, from the, from the sample grid. <clears throat> so, now we expose it to ammonia CR conditions, and that is NO, uh, ammonia, oxygen, and water. Uh, and uh, after one hour, they do the same analysis here. This is this part here, and another crystal. I can see oxygen, silicon, alumina, back, also copper. So somehow, during one hour only, copper has migrated into the zeolite structure. If you measure activity, just taking uh, the copper oxide powder here, uh, expose it for ammonia CR conditions, it's 500 ppm here, uh, NO, uh, and expose it, and we can see that it, nothing happens, and uh, after a while, high temperatures, ammonia is converted oxidized to NO, so no uh, ammonia CR activity at all here in this case. Uh, however, if we take uh, iron, aqueous iron exchange zeolite, in this case it's uh, copper, ZSN5, used, uh, produced by conventional methods, we can see that there is a significant ammonia CR activity already uh, at low temperatures here, and here at high temperatures it's starting to get uh, less selective. But for the physical mixture now that we have in this, in this uh, picture here, uh, we can see that the performance here is very uh, similar to, to the aqueous ion exchange zeolite. Another example is a copper SSZ13. In this case, it's prepared here by solid state ion exchange at high temperature. And then it's uh, treated in consequent uh, experiments by uh, ammonia CR. So it's uh, NO and ammonia, oxygen, and water. And we can see the first, uh, from the first round here, we have a temperature max, a commercial maximum here uh, in this interval. But then in the second and third uh, rounds here, uh, we have a higher activity. So something has happened with this zeolite despite it has been uh, treated at uh, 700 degrees when it was prepared. So, something is, uh, is, is, is ongoing here. And we have clear signs that copper migrates into the zeolite when we expose it for ammonia CR conditions. So, we want to explore this uh, further in detail. And uh, the question here is, can we prepare copper zeolites without using aqueous solution uh, by solid uh, iron exchange, but this time at low temperature, not at 700, 800 degrees Celsius. So we will explore the effect of the gas phase during this solid state iron exchange and uh, see how they work as ammonia CR catalyst. So we start with physical mixtures of either copper uh, oxide, and that is copper in oxidation state 2, or uh, copper uh, 2 oxide, and that is copper in oxidation state 1. So that is a reddish uh, copper oxide if you have done the experiment. Uh, we mix that with uh, either uh, large pore zeolites like uh, zeolite beta, uh, medium pore zeolites like uh, ZSN5, and uh, small pore zeolites as SSZ13. And then we analyze the effect of the individual components or components together uh, present in, uh, during ammonia CR conditions. We also also to follow this process. So we follow it by the CR activity to monitor the degree of copper exchange. We follow it by uh, SDM EDS to try to characterize the copper distribution in the primary particles of the zeolite. We follow it by in situ X-ray diffraction to see the course of copper migration. And we do it also by uh, theory, by first principle calculation, to explore the energetic conditions during this iron exchange process. So, can we use the SCR activity to monitor the copper migration? If we start from physical mixtures of copper oxide and ZSN5. And luckily, below about 250 degrees uh, Celsius, copper oxide is inactive for ammonia SCR, but uh, copper uh, ZSN5 shows some activity. 
So in this experiment, we start with a physical mixture here of copper oxide and ZSM5. Here's an MFI structure. We expose it to ammonia SCR conditions at 200 degrees Celsius, and we can see almost no activity at all. Then we'll raise the temperature just by 50 degrees Celsius, and we see an immediate rise here in conversion. But more interestingly here, by the time of exposure here, we see a gradual increase uh, of the conversion. So we have increased activity continuously here. After 20 hours, we stop the experiment, or uh, not stop the experiment, but we uh, decrease the temperature to the end of temperature, 200 degrees again, and we go down in conversion. But we have here now a high conversion that we had from the start. So something has happened with this zeolite. Uh, we do this experiment to check uh, what temperature is required to initiate this process. So we uh, do it in step by 50 degrees Celsius, expose it for one hour, go down to 200, expose it to uh, 50 degrees higher, 50 here, go down to 200 after one hour, and measure. And we see a maximum here of around 350, 400 degrees Celsius for the copper ZSM5 structure. So, obviously, by exposing this uh, physical mixture of copper oxide and ZSM5 uh, for ammonia CR conditions, the catalyst became more and more active during the process. The treatment here most likely facilitates migration of copper into the zeolite, uh, and the ammonia SCR activity can actually be used to monitor the extent of the copper migration. So, can we see this effect also of other types of zeolites? So we test uh, first a large core zeolite, copper beta, we do the same experiment. Uh, almost no activity from the start, increase the temperature to 250, and then we see a gradual increase with time of treatment. And then if we go back to 200 degrees Celsius again, we see a considerably higher activity than from the start. Uh, for the copper shabasite, uh, or for the shabasite structure, which has more, uh, small pores, uh, we need to go up in temperature here to 450 degrees, but we can see that we have a gradual increase by time by doing this uh, treatment. So also the physical mixture of copper oxide and uh, the large pore zeolite beta and physical mixture of copper oxide and a small pore uh, zeolite set as set 13 gradually became more active during ammonia exposure conditions. The migration of copper into the small core zeolite here uh, is slower compared to ZSL5 and beta, and this is likely due to the smaller core diameter of the zeolite. So, which components here in the SCR composition are the actual uh, guys here doing the job? So, in this experiment, we start with uh, copper oxide, physical mixture of copper oxide and ZSL5. Uh, we expose it to ammonia SCR conditions, and we uh, vary the uh, gas treatment during this exposure. So the fresh catalyst uh, or the fresh uh, mixture here by copper oxide and ZSO5 doesn't show almost no activity, uh, SCR activity at 200 degrees Celsius. So here in the first experiment here we have uh, water and oxygen as a base in the feed uh, and we gradually introduce uh, the other species here, NO and ammonia. So just water and oxygen, nothing happens. If we add NO, almost nothing happens. If we then uh, uh, add ammonia instead of NO, so we have uh, ammonia, oxygen, and water, almost not, nothing happens. But when we introduce uh, both ammonia and NO, oxygen and water, this is ammonia CR feed, uh, something happens here. Okay, then we want to. Uh, explore that further, so we take away the water, so we have just oxygen as the base in the feed. Uh, and we can see that the oxygen itself doesn't uh, do any job here. Uh, if we take some N and oxygen, we see a, a small increase here in activity. If we take ammonia and oxygen, we see a significant increase in activity. And if we take them both, ammonia, N and oxygen, we see an even bigger uh, increase in activity here. So, what happens if we take away the oxygen? We have water here as a base in the feed. Okay, water alone do something. Water and NO and ammonia do quite much. Then we take away both oxygen and water. Just have NO in the feed. Just have ammonia in the feed. And have ammonia and NO in the feed. So here is something happening. 
So we, what we can see here or learn from this is that the moon is a critical component here for the solid state ion exchange of copper into the zeolite at low temperature. And we see that uh, NU can uh, accompany this work by uh, promoting the reaction. So if we compare this uh, uh, solid state ion exchange uh, with aqueous ion exchange, so here we have uh, an aqueous ion exchange copper beta sample with different <laughs> loadings here of copper, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 1.4, 2, and 2.6, we can see a gradual increase in SCR activity with increasing copper loading. And if we now compare with a solid state ion exchange, we have just now uh, using ammonia and NOS, this combination was absolutely best. Uh, and we can see that uh, this mixture here, after 5 hours and after 10 hours, we have at least as high uh, activity here as compared to the ion, uh, aqueous ion exchange zeolite. And this is true also for the zeolite beta and copper, and it's true also for uh, the SSZ. 13 and copper oxide. So uh, uh, we can interpret this that this uh, uh, solid state ion exchange facilitated by ammonia and NO is a universal method to prepare uh, or to introduce copper into zeolites at uh, low temperatures. So uh, now we want to see the evolution here during the process using in situ x ray uh, diffraction. Uh, so we start here uh, with ammonia and NO in the feed uh, during this solid state ion exchange. Uh, now it's a physical mixture of copper oxide and ZSN5. And we follow the uh, crystalline phases here. First, we follow the copper phases, and we can see as we start with copper oxide during the treatment here, the copper oxide is consumed, and we don't have any copper oxide in the end here of the experiment. However, with the copper uh, CO2O, the uh, copper plus one oxide, uh, which we don't have in the, uh, from the start. X-ray uh, see that we form that, uh, it goes for a maximum and then it goes down here at uh, long exposure. And then if we see all the metallic copper, we can see here when uh, uh, the uh, copper one has reached its maximum, we start to form metallic copper. And metallic copper is not something we want actually because that works as an oxidation catalyst for, for ammonia. And we can also follow uh, what happened with, with the zeolite uh, structure, as that increases also when the uh, metal oxide, uh, the copper oxide decreases. So now we do the same experiment. Uh, now we take away the NO, so we have just ammonia, uh, and uh, during the exposure of uh, uh, copper oxide and ZSO5. And we can see that uh, copper oxide here uh, declines uh, slower compared to the experiments also with NO. Uh, the formation of copper one is also slower, it doesn't go beyond a maximum, and that is important because now we don't form any metallic copper at all. And also we see a gradual increase of the MFI structure. And if we do a ritual analysis here of the uh, structure here, what's happened with the zeolite parameters, we can see that uh, the, the, it expands, and uh, this is a sign of the ion exchange of uh, copper into the zeolite structure. And if we do it uh, just with ammonia, we see the same expansion, but it uh, proceeds slower. So uh, the solid state, uh, solid state ion exchange here is correlated with copper one. Uh, the zeolite fraction increases with exposure, and the zeolite unit cell also increases. Uh, we see that both ammonia and NO increases the rate of oh, the, the mixture with uh, ammonia and NO increases also the rate of. Uh, copper plus, uh, two plus copper one reduction is when the copper uh, one forms here. And we can see signs of over reduction to metallic copper by NO in the feed. Okay, then start with copper one oxide. So now we take just copper one oxide, we skip the NO and just have ammonia in the feed and mix that with ZSO5. And here we see a nice uh, graph here, we see uh, just a decline of the copper one oxide. Uh, we see no formation of metallic copper and we see a gradual increase of the zeolite fraction here in the, in the system. And if we compare here uh, with the zeolite lattice parameter ratio here, uh, we can see that uh, this method here, with starting with copper one oxide, we can see a gradual increase of, uh, of the uh, zeolite. Uh, cell, so we get in more copper in that. So a continuous uh, solid state ion 
iron exchange occurs with copper one oxide uh, without an over reduction of copper to metallic copper. In principle, we can reach a copper alumina ratio uh, to one. Uh, and now we want to see how copper is distributed in zeolite uh, after this uh, process. So in this case here, we have a SSF-13 uh, uh, mixture a bit of, uh, mixed with, with, uh, with copper oxide. And we expose that for ammonia and NO. And we uh, make an analysis here with, with STEM and EDS to uh, make an elemental mapping. So now we analyze the central part here of the zeolite. Uh, we get an EDS spectrum here. We have silicon, we have oxygen, we have aluminum, and we have small signs of copper here. And they can be enlarged here, and we see clear signs here of copper K alpha and copper K beta. And if we do the EDS maps here of silicon, it's evenly distributed, not so surprisingly, and oxygen as well, aluminum, and also copper. So copper seems to be very well dispersed here in the, in the zeolite. <coughs> Uh, and we also do uh, analysis through over the zeolite crystal here, starting from one end, go through the crystal and stop at the other end to see the uniformity. We can see that silicon and oxygen are evenly uh, distributed uh, uh, over the crystal, uh, also the aluminum and also the copper. And the corresponding elemental map, uh, maps here are silicon, oxygen, aluminum, and copper. And we can see that they are even distributed all of them. Here we see a nice, oh, nice thing, but we see an interesting thing. We see a small crystallite here of copper oxide, which hasn't uh, yet been iron exchanged to the zeolite, uh, so that uh, should be avoided. Uh, yeah, that was fine. So we can see that uh, most importantly here, copper is homogeneously distributed in the in the primary uh, cortex of the zeolite. Now we want to investigate the mechanism here. Uh, for the solid state iron exchange process here in the zeolite. Uh, how is the loop temperature solid state iron exchange of copper? How does that process taking place? Uh, we do that by theory. So we start with DFT calculations. Uh, we start with a copper one oxide surface as a copper one is the oxide here is, which is related with this iron exchange. Uh, and this structure here um, <coughs> has the lowest surface energy of the, uh, all the different kind of copper uh, one oxide surfaces. Uh, we can see that we have different kinds of copper species here. Uh, we have coordinately uh, saturated copper atoms here, and that means that they are bonded to two oxygens. And we have another type here, which is a coordinately really unsaturated copper atom. And that copper atom has just one friend here, and that is one oxygen here. Uh, and as we now study an iron exchange process, we will take away copper from the crystal. So that uh, makes it relevant also to introduce vacancy in the, in the crystal. So we have now introduced two vacancies. We have taken away uh, two uh, coordinately uh, unseparated uh, copper atoms and make the calculations on also that surface. Uh, that results in minor effects on the structure uh, when we take away two uh, uncertain copper atoms. We have a small charge uh, uh, change in short distribution in the top layer. Uh, it increases somewhat when we uh, remove uh, uh, the copper atoms. So now we want to absorb uh, ammonia on this system. And what's happened here is uh, that we absorb one ammonia. Uh, and that ammonia is sitting here on the top of one unseparated copper. Uh, we can see that without any vacancies in the system here, the ammonia will absorb on top of the unsaturated copper atom. And the absorption strength here is by uh, approximately uh, 1.4 electron volts. Uh, and if we have uh, vacancies also in the system, we have a somewhat uh, lower absorption energy. Now we absorb another one. <coughs> so we absorb a second ammonia on the uh, copper atom. Uh, and we can see without any vacancies, the absorption energy of the second ammonia here is slightly endothermic, but uh, with the vacancies, it's clearly exothermic uh, compared to the case with only one ammonia absorbed. 
And now the trick, uh, the two ammonia here, the bond is breaking here by the a copper, so we form this linear diamine copper complex. Uh, we can see that it is uh, almost linear here, uh, and the bonding distances here are about 1.9 angstrom between nitrogen and the copper. Uh, and the barrier to form this complex is low, it's only 0.4 electron volt uh, without uh, any vacancies, and it's uh, 1 electron volt with the vacancies in the structure. Now we want to transfer this diamine complex to the zeolite. Uh, we start to see this zeolite here as a silicon aluminum rate of 11, and that means approximately 1 aluminum uh, per cage. Uh, and the aluminum here is situated here, and uh, it has a uh, counter <coughs> proton here to co short compensate it close to the oxygen uh, next to it. So the proton is preferably uh, located here, adjacent to the aluminum in the four membered ring. Uh, then we introduce the amine species here, and we can see that in the zeolite, the amine species is still linear, it still has a bonding distance of 1.9 angstrom, and that means that there's almost no difference between the complex in the zeolite compared to the gas phase. So, uh, it's, and also it's preferably located on the six-membered ring, but it's quite loosely bonded, uh, and as the structure here is almost not affected by being inside the zeolite, it's almost only electrostatic uh, uh, interactions here between the complex and the zeolite. If we want to now to uh, uh, get rid of the ammonia here, uh, copper uh, my four, uh, copper one uh, plus, and it's located here in the six-membered ring. But this formation uh, of copper plus requires the composition of a complex, and that is a strong endothermic process by 2.7 electron volts. And what that means in practice is that copper plus is preferably solvated by sorbates especially by ammonia, uh, and that the complex is only weakly bonded with the zeolite. And then we have uh, uh, an, an proton, uh, which needs to get rid of, and here ammonia can uh, work as a, a proton carrier. It forms uh, amine complex here without any barrier, and then we can have an ion exchange process. So, if we now plot the energy landscape for this process, we start with zero, and zero for us is uh, the pure uh, copper one oxide surface, uh, the uh, zeolite in hydrogen form, so with the proton here, and two ammonia in gas phase. So the first step here, we absorb ammonia on the uh, unseparated copper atom here, and the uh, absorption energy here was 1.4 electron watt. Uh, the second ammonia absorbs also, that's a slightly endothermic process by 0.4 electron volt. Uh, the formation of the complex here is uh, quite a low barrier, as we said, 0.4 electron volt. Uh, <coughs> then we end up in a state here with a complex. And then we need to do the ion exchange trick here. So we want to have the amine complex in the zeolite, but we also want to get out the, the proton. And we get out the proton and transfer it to the copper oxide surface where it forms an OH group and then it can be oxidized to, to water. Uh, and that process is, uh, is uh, energetically favorable by 1.1 uh, electron volt. And if we do the same calculations also for the system with two copper vacancies, it's almost the same here, but now we start with the vacancies <coughs> in the copper oxide. We start with the zeolite in hydrogen form and the two ammonia here. Uh, we can see that uh, similar process steps takes place here. Now the second step is exothermic, and we have a somewhat higher barrier here to form the complex. But on the other hand, we have a much stronger uh, energy gain here by as much as 1.9 electron volt to do the ion exchange uh, uh, process. And we have also calculated a similar uh, exchange energy for the other systems. It's, uh, it's similar for, uh, yeah, it's similar for, for ZSM5 and also for zeolite beta. We will also check the diffusion barriers in the zeolite. Here we have the amine complex, 
uh, and it, it will go now from one cage uh, to the other cage here. It goes through the eight member ring <coughs> nicely. And we can see that we have a quite low uh, energy barrier, barrier here. It's a diffusion barrier here. Through the ring is only 0.3 electron volts, so it's, it's, it's a very little barrier actually. And then we want to also check uh, the mobility of all the amine species here. We have taken uh, care of the proton that formed an amine, and that amine needs to go from one um, eight member ring to the next neighboring eight member ring, and that uh, costs uh, 0.4 electron volts. And then it will go through uh, the eight member ring, and that costs also only 0.4 electron volts. So the copper amine complex and ammonium, uh, they easily facilitate copper and proton uh, transport in the, in the zeolite. So if we conclude here, <coughs> uh, we have seen that solid ion exchange uh, of copper into the zeolites, uh, starting with physical mixture of copper oxides and zeolites that occurs under SCR conditions at low temperatures. <coughs> uh, the process is facilitated by ammonia, if we start from copper oxide, uh, the solid state ion exchange is enhanced by the presence of ammonia and in combination with ammonia, it goes even, uh, even faster. But it may also lead to over reduction of uh, copper plus to metallic copper and that is uh, not beneficial as uh, metallic copper is a good oxidation catalyst for, for uh, ammonia. Uh, and we can see that starting from copper 1 oxide, uh, the process here can car be carried out with only uh, ammonia in the, in, the, in the feed. And that will uh, not cause an overreduction to metallic copper. Uh, the facilitating effect of ammonia here is related to the ability to form uh, this linear copper diamine complex. <coughs> The complex forms uh, rather easily on copper oxide, diffuses with low barriers into the zeolite framework and uh, through the framework between the cages. Uh, and the charge neutrality here is uh, maintained by counter diffusion of protons, uh, and the proton carrier here is ammonia in form of amine. Uh, and that goes to the copper oxide surface where uh, hydroxides uh, can be formed and uh, find the water. Uh, and the efficient solvation here of copper uh, and uh, protons by an ammonia renders the ion exchange process to be exothermic. And formation of copper plus is strongly endothermic, and that means that copper plus is preferably solvated in form of this uh, diamine complex and only weakly bonded to the zeolite. And the procedure is also universal, and we can apply it to several zeolite topologies like uh, BA and MFI and uh, CHA. We just take a home a message. We start with the copper oxide surface. We have two ammonia here. Interact with the surface, forms a diamine complex. That diamine complex is uh, diffused with low barriers into the zeolite structure, uh, where it is almost unaffected. Uh, the uh, bond angle and uh, bond distances here showing that we have a weak adsorption. Uh, the <coughs> proton here uh, is taking care of an ammonia, which works as a proton carrier, taking out the, pro uh, the proton, uh, which then is adsorbed on the copper oxide surface, and then it can form water. Some acknowledgements here uh, to my colleagues at the Competence Center of Catalysis at Chalmers in Göteborg colleagues at Halle Topse in Lyngby and at uh, Volvo and FA Company. And if you are more interested here, uh, Lin Chen will have a poster, and that's poster 60 uh, tomorrow, uh, where she will explain the uh, process more in deep proton for you who like EFT. So that was what I had to say. We have time for questions. Councilman Kewen, Motion State. Um, I'm just wondering, when you put the two ammonia on the copper oxide, they, why would it absorb right next to each other? 
um, if they're usually they would be they would want to probably stay as far apart as possible just mm -hmm. to avoid the bond molecules. And it's only when you would have a saturated surface yeah. that you would start to have them bonding together at the same site. Yeah, and probably they do, but uh, it's, it's quite low energies to, to do that. So uh, maybe you separate the, the, with, with one layer of uh, uh, ammonia first uh, before you uh, do the second step, the second ammonia. Right, so the, the energetics could probably change to what you just shown in reality. Yeah, that might be. Thank you for your nice talk. I have questions about zeolite. You talk about the formation of copper ion species in Chagajai. Yeah. You said the same things observed over beta and yeah, another one. But if yeah. you consider the anomaly distri distribution or T side, what about have you ever think about it? T side or anomaly distribution? Yeah, the word distribution is probably quite important. So. Now we just uh, investigated the case with one uh, uh, with one aluminum per per, per cage, uh, but of course um, uh, the alumina distribution is uh, has uh, importance for this. The T site among the zeolite is quite different, but you should consider the T site. Yeah, but that was a natural zeolite, so. Natural zeolites has uh, some problems actually, usually quite high aluminum content and they are quite big crystals and they contain a lot of impurities also. So I think the commercial zeolites are the zeolites which we, we can use. Magnus, when you get these uh, inside the zeolites, is there a change in the pore structure? What I mean by that, if you studied the uh, nitrogen or argon absorption, it might be that it actually shifts down yeah. where it absorbs because the pores are small. And that would be a very, very interesting characteristic of, of uh, characterizing the, the materials. Yeah, I agree. We didn't do uh, the, the uh, full isosomes here, but uh, that would be uh, a good suggestion. Okay, Delft University, nice talk. Did you consider in your mobility the Hüttig temperature? At the, the Hüttig temperature. At high temperatures. At the belt, the Hüttig temperature means that the uh, solid material can be mobile 30% of this oh, the, magic point. Yeah, for the Hüttig temperature. Yeah, we can see it. And I think that uh, we saw some excellent talks here yesterday uh, from Notre Dame and Purdue and uh, Cummins and also from PNNL. And uh, what I think what's hap what will happen here is that uh, at sufficiently high temperature, the, the mine complex uh, might, de de might decompose, actually. Uh, so uh, I think that, that temperature is here, has here clearly importance. Because I calculate it's 200 degrees centigrade for copper, a copper oxide. 200 degrees centigrade, temperature where you start to see mobility. Yeah. From I actually have the same question. Uh, it seems like uh, if this solid state process is really dependent on ammonia solvation effect, I can assume that when the temperature is high enough, this solvation effect will become less efficient. Yeah. And this process should slow down with increasing temperature. Yeah, we saw that actually on one of the first graph here where they tested the, the, uh, uh, the temperature for, for, for this uh, ion exchange process. And, and we saw a maximum with MFI around uh, 350 degrees Celsius and then it started to decrease. And that might, uh, as, as you said, uh, be related to that then you don't form the, the complex or you don't form it so efficiently anymore. Or you might decompose it on the way. And that varies actually with the zeolite. So, so uh, the maximum for, for the large pore zeolite is at the lowest temperature for the zeolite beta, and for the small pore zeolite, it's at, uh, at, at the highest temperature. Thanks. While the solid state method is nice, have you tried the analogous uh, copper amine complex as an ion exchange? 
Uh, no, in, not in this, uh, in, in this uh, project. We don't have. In, in the scheme that uh, you present, uh, you assume that the proton is actually migrating out from the zeolite. Yes. But you're not assuming any interaction of ammonia with the zeolite itself. Wouldn't there be one? Uh, one second. Yeah, uh, ammonia would interact with the zeolite yes. itself. And you're not including that in your... Yeah, of course, uh, ammonia will, uh, will interact with zeolite, but uh, we need to, to balance the charges here. If we introduce uh, positively charged uh, diamine ion complexes, we need to take away uh, positively charged also. But that doesn't uh, mean that ammonia is not interacting with zeolite, but that is just a calculation how protons can be transferred away. We have also considered uh, water as a proton carrying forming hydronium ions, but uh, that was not uh, as efficient as ammonia. So we think that ammonia is uh, the guy here who, who, who maintained the short balance.